flash back to a time before the Cambrian explosion, a time is about 560 million years ago. This would be the Ediacaran, and there's a number of odd life forms we know of from the Ediacaran, and one of the most famous of those is Dickinsonia. Dickinsonia, though, has been really hard to place on the Tree of Life. It's not a super detailed fossil. Dickinsonia is only known from three species on two continents, and almost one subcontinent in India, where there were some reported fossils of Dickinsonia that turned out to be fallen beehive combs. And that should tell you just how simple these fossils are. Now, the difference between the beehive comb that fell and these actual fossils is the fossils are actual impressions in the rock, not just some debris that landed on top of it. However, when you look at the fossil and some of those bee combs thought to be the fossil, you can see some similarities because it had these very distinct isomers or lines running across it. And it varied a lot in size from potentially just a few millimeters long to as long as 1.4 meters, which means it would have been about four and a half feet long at its largest. But all of those are still just at most a few millimeters thick. It's basically a pancake. And again, it's strange. We didn't know exactly what it was for a long time. And in some ways we still don't. We're just potentially getting closer to the answer. So let's look at what we know of it and potentially how it may have been. One of the most easy things to suggest it could have been is a bilateralian, meaning a bilateral animal. And when I say bilateral, it just means they're symmetric on both sides. There's one clear problem with that though when you look really closely at fossils of Dickinsonia. It's not symmetrical. As much as it seems like these isomers are just running straight across the body, they're actually offset slightly. I mean, they had a kind of glide symmetry. It's not a perfect symmetry like you'd expect in a bilateral animal. However, if it was a bilateral animal, that still leaves a lot of options for what it could have been, because bilateral animals are most of them. You're basically counting out corals, sponges, and jellyfish, and a few of their relatives, but that means there's still worms and vertebrates and echinoderms and arthropods that are all bilateral animals that it could have been related to or an early ancestor of which is really unfortunate for trying to figure out what exactly it was. But it's important to keep in mind that for the Ediacaran, having an odd symmetry isn't exactly strange. I already did a video on Tribrachidium, which was this weird animal, probably, that had three-way radial symmetry. So very interesting symmetries happening. You also have some of the frond fossils that had radial six-way symmetry. There's not something super consistent, about their symmetry, at least as far as being perfectly bilateral in most animals that we see today. But there's still other groups that already have older fossils. This includes some kinds of algae, including red algae, but also other things like fungi. So potentially it was one of those. And that's really important to understand because, you know, most people think of algae as being very single celled, but it actually can grow pretty large, especially certain types of red brown algae like kelp. People go, ah, kelp is a plant, it's not. It's an algae, a very, very large algae. So maybe Dickinsonia was just some proto-algae, proto-kelp type thing that would have lived on the seafloor and photosynthesized. We don't know for sure just yet. And as for fungus, there are fungus that still live in the oceans. We normally think about them being on land and growing mushrooms, but they are very diverse. It could have potentially been a very odd mushroom-like structure in the ocean. Fortunately though, there's other things we can look at to try and understand them especially those isomers. Now, first of all, some people have suggested that, hey, maybe it was actually bilateral in life, and when it died, there was just a taphonomic artifact or taphonomic process, essentially, as the animal decayed, it offset those isomers. Fortunately, though, that part's not as important as this next part of, we have a ton of specimens, meaning we can see Dickinsonias that are basically just starting out as very single round blobs and then expanding to become larger and larger. And because of that, we can see how those isomers actually develop. They would start towards what is presumably the rear of the body, and as the animal grew, they would shift in position upwards. This is interesting and obviously gives them their very similar appearance to things like trilobites, although not similarly related to trilobites as far as we know. This helps us to understand, though, that probably an animal, and that's largely because it would have been developing a cephalon, or a head and that would presumably be the front of the animal as far as we know, meaning the larger flat part without the isomers. There's also trace fossils of what is presumably Dickinsonia on the seafloor in the Ediacaran, and based on the shape of them, they were probably feeding, and by feeding, I mean just sucking up microbial mats from the seafloor. Not the most interesting lifestyle, but it's a living, 
And not every fossil of these organisms is perfectly preserved. Some of them are preserved kind of at an angle, which is interesting when we consider how we think these organisms got preserved. Essentially, we think there was a mud dune in the oceans that just collapsed and covered them up. And so what you're seeing when they're at an angle is these organisms trying to escape being buried alive, which is a little tragic and horrifying, but hey, makes for some really interesting fossils from before the Cambrian explosion again. Super interesting to see. What this all means is we have a better idea of what it was doing than what exactly it was. It would have been just kind of sliding along on the sea floor, eating occasional mounds of microbes and then just occasionally getting buried by mud and dying. Unfortunate for them, but good for us to understand how life really started to diversify even before the Cambrian. And as for what it was, there's some other ideas too. There have been ideas like, hey, it's a lichen growing on land. Fortunately for that researcher, the rocks don't really seem like they were developed on land, they seem like marine rocks, so from the ocean. So what was really needed for Dickinsonia was a new study method. And that's what happened in 2018 by absolutely obliterating some of the fossils, turning them into dust and seeing what biotrace marks may have been still left in the rock chemically. And what they found by analyzing the rock is traces of a sterile, which lots of organisms have sterols. It's not exactly super exciting until you realize that it's cholesterol, which actually does limit the options quite a bit. There's a few algae that do produce cholesterol, as well as one group of fungus but most importantly for us, the place it's most widespread is in animals. I mean, Dickinsonia was, with the other evidence, probably an animal. It's hard to say absolutely for sure that it was, but that's what it seems like it would have been. Now, there is still debate about this. Maybe it was a cholesterol from some kind of contamination in the lab, or maybe even it was just cholesterol from some other source in the ecosystem. Again, they obliterated these fossils into dust to be able to study them using these methods. So. It's hard to say for sure if it was directly associated with the fossil or just in some of the matrix around it. But it does seem likely, and I, I do think that it probably was an animal, at least of some variety. And that's especially true when looking at other organisms from the Ediacaran, especially some other organisms with glide symmetry like Spraginia. Spraginia looks like an animal. I mean, it just, it passes the, well, look at it test. It seems like it could be something leading towards other organisms with a distinct head, and then the rest of the segmented body. But again, it still has this glide symmetry. And that almost makes some sense when you think about how these organisms would have evolved from their hypothetical ancestor. This makes sense when you think of it evolutionarily. You would have had some sort of mostly round planktonic thing, something like a placozoan, the closest living relatives to the animals. And it's actually really interesting with placozoans because we don't really find them in the wild. We just find them when we pump in seawater for aquariums and things. So really weird organisms, but importantly, that would have been something similar to the ancestor of all animals. And eventually it landed on the seafloor, thought, hey, this is great living, and then they evolved down there. And some of them would have inverted and turned into things like corals and anemones, and some of those in turn would develop more significant medusa phases where they would be floating around on the sea currents, things like jellyfish. Meanwhile, other ones would have been living and feeding on microbial mats on the seafloor. And that's kind of what we expect to have been the case for things like Dickinsonia. And the thing is, they would have had radial symmetry ancestrally, but that would eventually evolve into bilateral symmetry because having a distinct front and back is good for moving around on the sea floor. It makes navigation easier. So potentially as that front and back part of the body evolved, that radial symmetry at first before developing true bilaterality was a glide symmetry and then eventually that turned into true bilateralism. So it seems to me at least like Dickinsonia and its relatives were probably stem bilateralians. I mean, not quite bilateral yet, but on the pathway there. And before anyone says something like, oh, well, if it was on its way to being bilateral, why wasn't it just bilateral? It still was probably better than being radial at that time. And that's an important feature to mention, right? Because not every animal is perfect. In fact, no animal is. If an animal was perfect, our bones would be made of aluminum because it's lighter and stronger than our bones. We are not built like that. Nothing is built perfectly, it's built good enough. And seemingly for Dickinsonia, glide symmetry may have been good enough to give it an edge. Fortunately for it specifically, it seems like bilateralism was even better and 
who knows, maybe it evolved into some of those bilateral animals. It's hard to know for sure, but it's very interesting because it's really one of our first good looks into how life became what it is, especially animal life. 